This is the UCD Centre for the History of Medicine in Ireland podcast. For details about the centre, please go to our website at www.ucd.ie forward slash chomi. To listen to other episodes from our archive, please visit the centre's iTunes page or our media website www.chomi.org. In this episode, recorded on the 20th of April 2017, Dr. Michael Sapol, a senior fellow at the Swedish Collegium for Advanced Study of Sala, reads his paper entitled Anatomy's Photography, Objectivity, Showmanship and the Reinvention of the Anatomical Image, 1860 to 1950. The chair for this paper was Dr. Catherine Cox, Associate Professor, School of History, University College Dublin, and Director of the UCD Centre for the History of Medicine in Ireland. Today we are very lucky to have uh, Mike Sapol um, over with us. Um, currently Mike is a senior fellow at the Swedish Colloquial for Advanced Study in Uppsala and before that he was for many years the cur curator historian at the US National Library of Medicine in Maryland so we could never ever have afforded to have Mike over prior to this so um, <laughs> now we've moved into more um, European now I'm, I'm a budget speaker you're a budget speaker <laughs> but not the content will not be budget well, Mike okay. is um, has worked on anatomy and images of the body and anatomized bodies for much of his career um, I came uh, to his work um, through uh, his 2002 publication A Traffic of Dead Bodies which was fantastic um, but since then he's published many, many volumes um, on anatomy and on how we should think and view uh, the human body in the modern period. Um, today he's talking about, I mean his most recent book, there are many, I won't list them all, but his most recent book, um, Body Modern, Fitz Kahn, the Scientific Illustration. Publisher um, commanded me to uh, There you go, and I'll cover the subject. Uh, it's literally just published by University of Minnesota Press and now he's going to talk on his new work um, and the paper today is entitled Anatomy's Photography, Objectivity, Showmanship and the Reinvention of the Anatomical Image from 1860 to 1950. So, thank you. Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. I never have been to Ireland uh, before and so this is great. It's one of the perks of my job. I get to come to nice places like this. Uh, so welcome. This is uh, Anatomy's Photography. It's my current thing, a work in progress. It's a bit rough, uh, a bit of a mess. Uh, I'm exploring a nearly entirely, a, a nearly entirely, I guess that's a contradiction, neglected body of 19th and 20th century anatomical uh, imagery and also a uh, neglected body of photographic imagery. So this intersects kind of both those histories and the plan is to do a show and tell, uh, present some of the varieties of photographic anatomical experience, uh, provoke you with images, lots of images, and see what happens. Uh, before we get underway, I'm obliged to warn you that this presentation will show photographic images of dead people who are anatomically dissected or sliced or peeled or taken apart in some other way. Uh, some of these images are not pretty. Uh, they demonstrate that human beings are creatures made of flesh and bone and skin and full of parts and textures and shapes. In some images, faces and genitals of the dead will be visible. Uh, even though none of the anatomized subjects ever gave their consent to be photographed or displayed. Of course, they didn't have uh, consent forms back then. Um, if that makes you feel too uncomfortable, you feel you shouldn't or don't have the right to look, uh, any reason at all you may depart, you don't need my permission uh, now or any time, uh, without any penalty, no shame, it's okay. Uh, it, it's interesting, I mean, that often tends to be gendered, as I say, in a room where there are a lot more um, women than men. Uh, but uh, we can talk about that later. I do hope you will stay. Your responses, whatever they may be, are entirely valuable to me and my project. 
which is about the power and uses and meaning of the photographic anatomical image, about the difference that photography makes, and about the changing practice and ethics of anatomical display, and about anatomical voyeurism and prurience as people debated those things in the 19th and early 20th century, of course, and we debate them now. So that said, hold on to your hats. Uh, so we start by uh, considering this soiled figure from Nikolaus uh, Rudinger's Atlas of Peripheral Nervous System. It's the first photographic anatomical study, uh, unbound, 26 centimeter uh, large folio published in Munich in 1861. Rudinger was then an ambitious 29 year old anatomical uh, demonstrator. I can't find any portraits of uh, the young man is photographic anatomist, so uh, I just have this to, you can see him later in his career. Uh, uh, the photographs printed on paper separately from the text, pasted onto the printed page. Uh, uh, observe that while the image is evidently photographic and advertised as such, it's actually a hybrid of drawing and photography. The hand of the artist compensates for the technical limitations of uh, the photograph, which in 1861 were very many. Um, artificial light sources weren't strong enough to light uh, uh, the anatomical subject, uh, so unfocused daylight had to be used. It's hard to make images legible. Dark areas of the body tended to um, turn to black and hard to print photographic images in large quantities, near impossible to print them on the same page as text. Hence pasted onto the pages of the folio. Uh, Rudinger's atlas was published under the aegis of the Literary Artistic Institute, Literarische Artistische Anstalt, which tells us that photography was regarded as both an artistic medium and a scientific uh, technology, and that um, cultural, scientific, medical, aesthetic accomplishments were taken to be allied and not opposing categories. The publisher, Kota Shen, was one of the great presses of German Romanticism and published works by Goethe, Schiller, Schelling, and Danish philosopher, physicist, Hans Christian Ersted. In 1861, uh, photography and medicine, generally, not just in anatomy, was new and exciting and performed the modern, uh, created a buzz uh, which attracted the patronage of the court of Bavaria, Bavaria's King Maximilian II, and then his son and successor, King Ludwig II, so often called Mad King Ludwig II. Uh, Rudinger's photographer was Josef Albert, a uh, bohemian savant, the court photographer, who photographed uh, the Bavarian royals and their friends, uh, and photographed many scenes zonked out scenes, I would say, from uh, Wagnerian opera, which was also a subject of patronage of the court. Wagner was uh, their pet composer. Uh, there's an improvisational feel to the atlas. Rooting is trying things out. Uh, some of the plates are so heavily retouched that the underlying photograph is almost entirely obscured, covered up by uh, pen and brush. The image loses its photographicity, although that's the big, uh, that's advertised on the cover and, and is what's really novel and, and important about this. So in this plate, the photographic parts of the image are only apparent in the border lines. Uh, the, you can see the bony ripples, uh, a little bit in the back of the head, uh, the five o'clock shadow under the nose. I know with, you're seeing a, a kind of degraded version of these, obviously, because uh, it's going through digitization and projected and, and not an entirely dark room, but I didn't want you to go to sleep, so we'll keep the lights on. Uh, in the final volume of the folio, published in 1867, six years after the first, plates take on a different look. Some of the figures uh, are photographed against dark backgrounds to provide more contrast, and some appear to be raw, unaltered by uh, the artist's hand, an artist's hand. Uh, one other thing's apparent, the images are exceedingly 
ugly, uh, even artless. Uh, unlike most contemporary artists drawn in anatomical illustration, uh, uh, which has some finesse, and there's nothing that I've seen in this period that's comparable in ugliness to what you're seeing now. Uh, the emphatic ugliness asserts the truthfulness of the image, asserts Rudinga's modernness and commitment to objectivity and to science, uh, which is a rejection of what is the dominant uh, trend in Central European anatomy, a rejection of the belief that in nature, and that this is the key, in nature the beautiful and the true converge. This is a uh, uh, that there's beauty and truth and truth and beauty, so no. Um, and of course that credo had some repercussions that destabilized the concept of beauty, have the effect of expanding and revising what counts for beauty, which is no longer kept distinctly separate from the sublime and other kinds of aesthetic categories, so that uh, around the same same time, uh, the Swedish anatomist Anders Retzius uh, is dissecting parasitic worms, which are kind of slimy and ugly to us, perhaps. But he said, he writes, kind of rhapsodizes about the beauty of them. So he's expanding the the concept of what constitutes beauty. Uh, Rudinger's photographic anatomy, then uh, rejection of natural philosophy, uh, is a generational conflict and succession story. Uh, how to get modern, how to get scientific story, because in the middle and late decades of the 1800s, gross anatomy was at a crossroads. Uh, for centuries, anatomy had been the most visible and exciting part of the program to scientize medicine. But by the 1860s, it had a lot of competition. Uh, pathology, microbiology, embryology, neurology, psychiatry, surgery, physiology were coming fields. Uh, where medical students of the previous uh, generation clamored to dissect, they now were clamoring to work with achromatic microscopes and other new instruments and technologies in the laboratory and the clinic, and also comparative approaches. So even if they were dissecting, they wanted to compare different species of animals. That was kind of a, the trendier thing. Uh, photography was also a coming thing. Uh, in an 1860 medical journal, Ransford E. von Giesen, an ambitious 24-year-old surgeon of Brooklyn, New York, wrote that, quote, there is no art that has made such rapid strides in this, the most progressive of all centuries, as that of photography. The most profound philosophers of this age have studied and elaborated it as a science, while thousands are daily practicing it as an art. No single branch of art is so universal, no science of modern times is more has more engaged the attention of philosophic investigators. No science or art, not strictly medical, will more richly repay the scientific physician. Extolling photography, quote, this truly beautiful science, quote, in, quote, this, the most progressive of all centuries, uh, Van, Van Giesen repeatedly invokes the word science and so uh, makes a pact with his medical readers. We're physician, we physicians are scientific moderns. Medicine, science, and the field of photography are progressing in a very particular time, modern times. This strong historicist sense that this is a new and unprecedented age. Uh, most of Van Giesen's article is devoted to photographic microbiology, again, combining these two very hot and very modern approaches. Uh, but before Van Giesen gets into it, he offers a list of other potential medical applications, and he starts with anatomy. To the anatomist, photography can secure accurate representations of anatomical specimens, which for faithful delineation far surpass the most trustworthy engraving. So there's still this idea that the photography is like the pencil of nature, uh, uh, strong kind of metaphoric resonance in the relationship between pen or pencil or brush and any form of representation. And he says the pathologist can fix upon paper the most rare and curious specimens of disease. The surgeon will be enabled to present the most exact appearance of the deformity in any given fracture, dislocation, or any exter external surgical lesion, whatever. 
So Van Giesen's enthusiasm for photography, his faith in its power to accurately represent objects, persons, and scenes, and its special role as a vector of modernity, these are all typical of mid-19th century discourse on photography in medicine and in 38 other disciplines, I mean, in ge geology and all the rest. Uh, there's a sense that photography is the technology of modernity, or at least one of them. Uh, photography, as uh, Roland Bart and many other scholars have observed, has a reality effect, is a visual rhetoric of the real, points to some scene, some ensemble of objects as they uh, were situated in a particular space and time. In the wake of Bart's and Photoshop, we of course have been sensitized to the multiple ways in which photography is not a simple transcription of reality. Uh, the way in which a picture and its subjects can be posed, lit, cleaned up, framed, contextualized, altered to suppress or emphasize detail, even make things up. Uh, the photographic view is a contrivance and not raw reality. But for Van Giesen and his contemporaries, photography had enormous and inarguable epistemological authority. Uh, they believed that the photograph showed disinterested, objective, and abundantly detailed views. Quote, it's an absolutely unprejudiced observer. The sensitive plate records with absolute fidelity the image thrown upon it. Gives, quote, the impression of an infinite amount of detail. And we, you know, ambivalently, of course, agree with this because we live in a photographic civilization or a digitized photographic civilization. Uh, but let's take these texts, these comments as representative texts for what a few decades later, a less enthusiastic writer of the 1890s called, quote, the craze for medical photography, which is to say that medical photography was troubled by unseemly pleasure, uh, pleasure in photographic apparatus and technique, tinkering and experimenting, and pleasure in the showing and viewing of bodies, body parts, and objects, pleasure in novelty for novelty's sake. And this, is, this was especially true in the field of gross anatomy. The photographic anatomist positioned himself as an objective observer and a showman. The joy of photography, its modernist and nerdy technologistical complexity fused with the abundant pleasures of anatomical exhibition and pleasure in the display of that centuries old anatomical specialty the normative body turned inside out, the human form converted into freaky monstrosity. Anatomists used photography to perform themselves as modern and scientific and objective, but the process and results were peculiar at odds with disinterested objectivity. When Nicholas Rudinga, Eugène Louis Dewey, and another anatomist took to photography, they took liberties. They manipulated their photographs in theatrical and painterly ways demonstratively cutting, slicing, posing, lighting their cadavers and body parts to suit the camera. The photographic images were silhouetted, drawn on, colored, superimposed over other photos, cropped, diagrammed, and outfitted with auras of textual uh, captioning. The artist's pen and brush were as evident as the anatomist saw in scalpel. Uh, all were subject to aesthetic considerations, uh, uh, theatrical considerations. The photographic image put on a show on the printed page or on the walls of the exhibition hall or the lecture hall screen, because they also projected these images with, in lantern slides, or, or in the visual field of the stereoscopic viewer. That show, in turn, referred back to performances in the dissecting room, surgical theater, classroom, and anatomical museum. Uh, this is this idea of intermediality or remediation that, uh, I don't know whether that's, uh, that's a, a term of art for you guys, but, but it also referred to the theatrical stage, the art gallery, the carnival tent, and the magazine advertisement. But science, critics argued, should be conducted with a certain sobriety. Too much pleasure in the show subverted the ethos of disinterested scientific investigation. One could be a judged vulgar, stained by association with displays of fairground anatomy, and the peep show. Even if the images were, these kinds of images, such as uh, what you're seeing now, were sequestered from the lay public, 
even if the audience was entirely medical. Tasteful restraint, scopic modesty, was increasingly regarded as a constituent requirement of the performance of scientific modernity. Uh, and that dismissive opinion is surely one reason why many anatomists were reluctant to sign on to photography. There was, of course, of course, these other reasons, the technical difficulties, the problems with lighting, depth of field, printing, uh, and so on, and color and texture. But um, now, uh, over the decades, many of those difficulties were overcome. Yet photography still failed to dominate anatomy. Anatomy as a discipline was heavily invested in artist-made illustration and the art of illustration, loyal to uh, representational tradition, a representa traditional representational practice. The anatomist-artist collaboration was a vital part of the refounding of the discipline in the 1500s with Vesalius and his successors. Uh, as was the tradition of anatomist and student drawing. Student uh, uh, drawing was valued as a heuristic device, a practical way to learn and cognitively recognize the structures of the human body for the sake of study. And also just, this is a culture of drawing as pleasure, drawing as artistic refinement. Um, if, if you have a, a, a high education, you would, might have a dance master and a drawing master who would uh, you know, help you attain some skill and a music master. Uh, drawing with pen and pencil was figured as an analog and complement to dissection with knife and scalpel, and the beautifully illustrated and printed anatomical atlas was taken to be the highest and uh, most expensive and collectible form of medical publication. That aesthetic investment in anatomical illustration connected medicine not just to science, but also to Greco-Roman uh, civilization and the post-Renaissance tradition of figurative naturalism, uh, refinement, civilization. Uh, anatomy was a foundational subject in both the medical school and the art academy. So as a representative, there, I could show you a million uh, pictures to illustrate this, but take here this uh, 1856 lithograph by anatomist artist Joseph MacLeese, an Irishman. Uh, a double figure study with sensual and erotic valences. It was published in an atlas marketed to practicing surgeons and their students, and it reigned as a standard work well into the 1890s for surgeons, uh, not for art lovers, uh, and was regarded as, but still, as an artistic as well as an anatomical masterpiece. I love this image, which is, I mean, the, the figures sort of look like marionettes or it's clear choreographed doing a dance and MacLeese was just a brilliant brilliant artist uh, as I say he was from County Cork but he made his way to London uh, photography's exponents had to situate themselves in relation to this commitment to art one way to deal with it was to use photography as a way to modernize and improve the accuracy of hand-drawn anatomical illustration Lithographs and engravings could be based on reference photographs, and Swedish anatomist Gustav Retzius used them in, in that way as far back as the 1850s. Uh, the hand-drawn artwork could then serve as a legible surrogate for the only partly legible photograph, which in turn was offered as an epistemological warrant for the accuracy of the drawing and a check against artist-introduced uh, error, the errors that artists introduced into the illustration because they weren't trained as anatomists, although some like MacLeese were both. Uh, there was then a dynamic relation between photography and anatomical illustration. Artists tried to make their illustrations uh, be as accurate as photographs and have a photographic look. Photographers aspired to make their photographs to be as legible as artist-drawn illustrations and have some of the aesthetic qualities of artist-drawn illustrations. Or not. I, so, here, the figure on the right is from Rudinger's 1870 volume of artist-drawn anatomical illustrations based on photographic images, using photographic images as a reference. But the photographic original, the figure on the left, is not a pure photograph. Far from it. it the plate's been heavily retouched to make the image clearer and cleaner, to bring out certain aspects of the anatomy of the head. And oddly, I think, to my eyes, uh, the photographic original is in some ways more legible 
than the steel engraved artist rendered copy. Uh, neither image is especially beautiful, but the artist drawn engraving is less busy, less messy. As I was telling Catherine, I, I was showing these um, two nights ago. I had dinner with an anatomist, who, someone who teaches uh, anatomy at Cambridge, and who is also a, a brilliant illustrator. So she was going through these and sort of pointing out all these very fine details and interesting differences, but uh, I can't reproduce that now. It would detain us too long. Um, so the aesthetics are complicated. Are these images from Eugène Louis Doyen's early 20th century photographic atlas beautiful or ugly, practical or theoretical, uh, rational or demented, sober or scandalous? Now we can pose questions like these, odd questions, is an indication that photographic anatomy, whether performed in the anatomical margins or in the mainstream of uh, anatomical uh, teaching, was connected to large issues. There's the issue of epistemic authority and scientific publication and practice, questions of how objectivity, uh, knowledge production, and the truth are validated and sustained in representation and performance and in reading and viewing. These questions go to the origins of science as an idiosyncratic category and discourse and practice. Science was performed in text and image and diagram in, in the museum specimen and the laboratory experiment, the expedition, the microscopic view, etc. When photography was deployed as a rhetoric of mechanical objectivity, what difference did it make? And I'm gesturing here to a book that some of you may know, which is uh, Lorraine Dastin and Peter Gallison's work titled Objectivity. Uh, and how did the anatomical photograph fix or disrupt the medical gaze and the subject that it constitutes? And they're gesturing to the work of Michel Foucault. Uh, the issue of aesthetics in the scientific image, the relationship between art and science and artist and scientist, and relations, as I've pointed out already, between the beautiful and the true, between beautiful and ugliness, as structurally opposed signifiers of the real. So an odd thing in this project as I'm sort of getting into it is it's really partly about the cultural meaning, the semantics of ugliness. Uh, and there's the problem of the tacit and articulated conventions and genres of the picture and pictorialism in art and science, and in the larger image world, um, the picture environment uh, and these are issues that are at the heart of work by uh, many, many art historians and, and historians of visual culture, Rosalind Krauss, Horst Breitkamp, Alfred Tauber, and Martin Kemp, a uh, long succession of art historians. Uh, and there's the issue of the visual rhetoric and the performance of the modern, where modernity is a moving target and a capacious signifier, and science and scientificity are moving targets within the moving target. Uh, which in a different register, subject of my new book, <laughs> uh, and work by Andreas Killen, Cornelius Bork, Janet Ward, uh, a bunch of other historians as well. And finally, there's the issue of intermediality and the changing work and effects and meaning of images and objects in science and the broader domains of culture, which is bound up with the politics of image versus text. What is the more privileged mode? What are their special characteristics? Image versus embodied life. You know, there's a translation of embodied life through dimensionality to the, the flat page. Um, uh, and particular types of images versus other types of images, the cross-section versus illusionistic perspective. These are all at play here and all in dialogue with each other. Um, so I could go on about that, but I think I won't. Uh, and just to say one more thing, in all this there's a performative dimension. Photographic anatomy, performed anatomy as science, performed the photographic anatomist as a scientific doctor or uh, a medical scientist, performed science as modern and signified a break from the anatomical tradition a reinvention. And as you may surmise from the image shown here on the screen, uh, the reinvention in this case was productive. 19th and early 20th century photographic cross-section anatomy helped lay the conceptual uh, foundations of the methods of late 20th century medical imaging revolution associated with the CT scan and all the rest. That is really 
this is the foundation. These are the people who first conceptualized it. You can make thin slices of the body and photograph them and see everything in situ. And we'll, I'll get, get go more on that as we go on. But now I'm going to sort of shift for a, a little second to outside of photography. There, of course, in this period, in the mid 19th century, there are many ways to be anatomically modern. Photographic anatomy was preceded by, and in the 1870s became entangled with, a movement with similar aims and aspirations, cross-sectional topographical anatomy. Again, this is part of the foundation of the CT revolution and MRIs and all the rest. Uh, topographical anatomy, a new field based on new techniques, allowed anatomists to show off their modernity and scientificity by making a critique of classical anatomy and its methods. In classical anatomy, the anatomist dissects out parts and systems, uses a scalpel and other instruments. Much of the material is thrown away. Some of it's retained to make preparations of specimens for collection and display. Uh, illustrations of the dissected body or prepared specimen are usually rendered in some kind of illusionistic perspective. In cross-sectional topographic anatomy, the anatomist deep freezes a corpse, and initially, this is before refrigeration, they do this in the dead of winter, of course, Nikolai Pirogov, the Russian, is, becomes a master of it. He's got a longer and colder winter, but it's invented in the Netherlands, and there are all these techniques for how to pack the body in uh, canal ice. And, uh, and uh, anyway, so uh, the body is, the anatomist deep freezes a corpse, uses a saw, and they, they discuss in the literature, you know, which kind of saw is good. And I, I look up these saws, and they look a little like just carpenter saw, saws, you know, good quality carpenter saws. Uh, and then uh, they try to do that as, as, with the, as great craftsmanship as possible. And then such surfaces, the flat surfaces, are traced uh, onto paper. The tracings are given over to artists and printers for refinement, label cover, coloring, slices and derivative illustrations usually arranged in a series and so participate in something that was called the serial method, uh, which was then a staple of comparative anatomy, embryology, and the physical sciences. The claim was that topographical illustration showed the relation of the parts in situ was more precisely accurate than freehand artist rendered illustration. It's the same claim that people apply to photography. Um, and uh, the cross-section was particularly suited to book publication. The body was sliced in a series of planes each one corresponding to a printed page. Uh, in the 1860s and 70s, Leipzig, Leipzig uh, anatomist Wilhelm Brauner was the chief exponent of this method. This large format atlas of 1867 and 72, celebrated as a scientific and aesthetic achievement. Uh, his illustrations glowed with color, the exclamatory aura of captions. Uh, it was spectacular. It was regarded as spectacular and set the standard for illustrated topographical anatomy for many decades. So this really had a buzz. And students came from all over to uh, study, especially from the British Isles, which so there was kind of an Edinburgh school that was sort of based on what uh, Brown, Brown taught in uh, Leipzig. Uh, now this is important because after Brown, most photographic anatomy was topographical, in part because it was easier to light, photograph, and legibly print a two-dimensional slice than a three-dimensional dissection or object. The brain, uh, a fashionable subject of anatomical research, was an obvious choice for photographic study. Uh, brains, brain slices were very legible on a photographic plate in this early phase of, of um, experimentation with phot photography. The slices were small enough to be lit evenly, easy to pose before the camera. Uh, one could supply an accompanying diagram based on a trace of the photograph. The diagram was in some ways the result. Um, the photograph was the evidence, a rhetorical, rhetorically powerful object, a guarantor of the diagram's truthfulness. And this is uh, the earliest photographic study of the brain, uh, Jules Bernard Louise, 1873, photographic iconography of the central nervous system. Photographs are pasted, again, onto the page. Moving on. But change was forthcoming. The same year that Luis publishes, uh, Joseph Albert invents a variation on the colotype printing process, 
uh, which he named Alberto type. Uh, a year later, he devised a three-color version of the process, and this technological improvement permits Rudinger to study a greater variety of photographic subjects, the hand, the infant, the face, the ear, and the published product could take on a more polished and legible look, take on some of the qualities of artist-made illustration. And as we've seen Rudinger's earlier black and white study of the peripheral nerves using the traditional method of classical anatomy dissection, was only available in a large format unbound folio edition. The images were grayish, uneven, unlovely. Rudinger's topographical surgical atlas of the late 1870s, the Topographische uh, Chirurgische uh, Anatomie des Menschen, uh, featured brightly colored photographic frozen cross sections of adult heads and infants that nearly jump off the page. And the images didn't have to work in tandem with the diagram. They were the diagram, did all the work of anatomical illustration, have little numbers on them, which you can't see. And, uh, and actually, that's, that was considered to be a fault. Critics complained that the little numbers were hard to see. Um, the colotype process involved directly printing photographic material from lithographic stones. But here again, the photographicity of Rudinger's color plates is only partial, a signifier of the real. The images are hybrids, photographic paintings, painted photographs. Art historian Martin Kemp compares them unfavorably to Brauna. Uh, but this scants Rudinger's achievement. Uh, Brauna was the top dog of topographical anatomy, a uh, pillar of the German medical establishment. Students came from all over the world to study with him. Uh, in comparison, Rudinger was disadvantaged. He was born the 12th son of a farmer and butcher. His father died when he was only three. Uh, unable to afford medical school, he was a, instead apprenticed uh, to a barber. Uh, the German-speaking lands in the 1850s were in some ways the most advanced in Europe, in other ways the most traditional. Uh, in Heidelberg, members of the Guild of Barbers were permitted to take one course in anatomy. Uh, uh, Rudinger took advantage of that to get a barber's degree in what was called minor surgery. In other words, in the year 1850, at the age of 18, he became a barber surgeon, uh, which is an ancient occupational category that had been discarded in England and France 100 years earlier, uh, when guilds of barber surgeons uh, were separated, the barbers and surgeons were separated, broken apart. A few years later, after receiving a small inheritance, Rudiger was able to take the full course of medical instruction and eventually eventually received a full medical degree. He excelled at Heidelberg and in Munich, showed great talent, but even with the patronage of major figures like uh, Theodor von Bishop and Eustace von Liebig, and with friends in the court of Ludwig II of Bavaria, he still couldn't get a regular appointment to the medical faculty. The social prejudice against barbers, people of his rank, of his social class, weighed too heavily against him. So, 15 years after his first photographic anatomical study and numerous publications, he was still only a prosector, an assistant, and an adjunct. Uh, given this situation and his great ambition, he was perhaps driven to dramatize his expertise and his commitment to science and uh, more modernized and more scientific anatomy. So he does this. Um, he couldn't top Brown. Brown uh, Rudinger's atlas was smaller format, printed on lower quality paper. Even so, uh, the colorized photographic plates, starkly silhouetted against a black background, had flair. Um, his topographical atlas placed him up there, not quite with Brown, but in the top rank, as a, as a fellow topographical anatomist and innovator. And in 1880, at age 48, helped him to receive a full appointment to the medical faculty. Brown, in contrast, got a full appointment when he, in his late 20s. Um, but uh, Rudinger's atlas did not receive universal acclaim in an 1891 review of the history of photographic anatomy. The eminent Swiss anatomist Wilhelm Hiss dismissed, quote, images such as the topographical anatomy of Rudinger, which are half photograph, half painting, because they make, quote, a pretty uncomfortable impression. And Hiss goes on to say, drawings copied from uh, the photograph and rendered in an appropriate manner he, uh, would be as trustworthy as photography, but more beautiful. 
Now, to my eyes, uh, Rudinger's plates are beautiful. Um, but here again, the most photographic, least painted parts of the image are the undissected parts, the borderlands of the image. The dissected parts are colored and painted to look more like artist drawn chromolithograph, and they're actually much less detailed than Browna's uh, artist drawn uh, anatomy. Uh, now, Hiss doesn't comment on the convergence that this is starting to look like uh, an artist drawn uh, illustration, nor does Hiss acknowledge that the highly naturalistic artist made illustrations with their grotesque views of the dissected body could also induce discomfort. There were artist drawn illustrations that are difficult to look at, that are not so beautiful, although they might be beautifully rendered. And that's a kind of one of those contradictions to think about. And Hiss doesn't acknowledge also that medical men were empowered by training and status to see the difficult anatomical subject and trained to rise above it, above the discomfort, and even to relish it, because the difficult image and off, was often enough regarded as a strange kind of luxury good uh, among the, in the cult of, of professional medicine, an exotic visual experience, something to produce collect, share with colleagues, and write about. And a shared secret within the cult. What you wouldn't want to do is let the public see it. So you know, you would not be, should not be allowed to see it. I should not be allowed to see this, because we're not doctors. Well, maybe there are some doctors here. I don't know. Are there? Anyone? OK. <laughs> no. All right. So his disapproved of photographic anatomy, disliked reading his atlas. But he did praise one work of photographic anatomy, the Irish surgeon Alec Fraser's spectacular life-size guide to operations on the brain, which looks fairly discomforting to me, quite ugly, um, but is, is a, a quite impressive. It's such an odd thing that even his, who was a big snob, and also it was life-size. There, that, there's something about accuracy, you know, as in William Hunter's Anatomy of the Gravid Uterus, it's monument, you know, size matters, you know, monumentalism counts in this world. Um, Fraser made uh, composite photographs. Uh, the composite photograph conveyed a sense of photographic depth achieved by uh, laying one photographic plate or exposure on top of another. Uh, the composite overlaying of successive dissections of the same subject here. So you're seeing really three or four. And he, he'll, he took the, the subject, photographed it, dissected it, took it in the same position, uh, did more dissection, uh, and also sometimes made casts of, of it in a particular uh, phase. So um, th this is kind of a collapse, a, a collapse, a sequence of photographs collapsed into one image. Uh, technique was introduced, as you probably know, by Francis Galton for the purposes of eugenical study and for a decade or so was quite trendy modern. Um, we don't know much about Fraser. That's one of the things I'm going to do tomorrow is go to the Royal College of Surgeons of Ireland and hope to learn more. Uh, I don't know his birth and death dates. Oh, well, I do know that, but I, I don't know anything about him, really. Um, he was professor of surgery at the Royal College of Surgeons in Dublin. Uh, and I've read a few of the reviews. One reviewer praised his guide to operations on the brain as a novel contribution to practical surgery and aid to surgeons. Um, I, I need to do more. I'm not really sure whether that's true because that was uh, someone who wrote about it 20 or 30 years later. Um, now, the apparatus to hold the specimen, this is how this technique is done. Uh, um, the apparatus to hold the specimen and register for multiple composite photograph appears in the illustration on the right. Composite photograph photography, mostly used in racial anatomy and criminology, produce images of what were thought to be ideal types. There's a lot of coverage on this and excitement about this in the weekly and, and press and monthly magazines and journals. Uh, there's a lot of fooling around. Uh, in 1885, someone published composite photography applied to portraits of Shakespeare. 
So the idea is you can sort of average things out, and sometimes people use you know, a thousand images to so it's that it's seen as almost a statistical technique uh, for the purposes of of creating ideal types. Uh, the technique creates a strange type, strange kind of typological depth. Uh, you overlay the images to make archetypal composite specimens. Uh, of course, depth is more directly evo evoked in the stereoscopic photograph, which also had a buzz in the 1890s. And I, I don't have a lot of time. To, this is a quite a big subject, and I don't have time today to say much about stereo anatomy, except to say that it was yet another way to be scientific and modern, or be scientific and modern in two ways simultaneously: stereoscopic and photographic. Uh, one holds the stereoscope up to one's eyes, which initiates an intensive gaze, or maybe not. I mean, the stereoscope can be like a, a, a pleasurable gimmick. Uh, that gestures toward modernity and scientificity, but not really practical for use as a real book might be. Or you know, maybe, maybe it is uh, uh, intensive. Stereos stereoscopy doubles down the photographic reality effect, makes the photograph into an even closer proxy of the anatomical specimen, and the stereoscopic atlas uh, is a proxy or substitute for the anatomical museum. And this is how they're advertised. Around 1900, the anatomical museum was at its height, had not yet received any articulated critique, at least the medical anatomical museum. The popular museum had plenty of critiques. But on the ground, uh, these professional museums were already threatened by collections of slides and photographs. Museums were costly, difficult to maintain, required great skill, were labor-intensive, space-consuming, not very accessible. The objects of the museum could not easily circulate, whereas flat cards and glass slides and x-rays, in contrast, compact and comprehensive, easy to store in labeled cabinet drawers, easy to reproduce and circulate. Stereo card was a kind of compression technology, a way to make three-dimensional objects flat, but you could sort of decompress them by looking at them right through the viewer. Uh, depending on the viewing device, the stereographic series could contain sequences that show progressive dissection in time, and in, and in the viewing be a form of sequential media, sequential art. So the Edinburgh Stereoscopic Atlas went through many editions of box sets. It focused on parts, not whole bodies. A pretty sober piece of work, no drama, not, not much theatricality. Retouching is subtle, so as not to degrade the epistemological virtue of the photograph. Numbered labels applied right on the specimen, um, promoted as valuable to students and surgeons who lacked access to a, a comprehensive anatomical museum collection. In other words, students and surgeons in the provinces. The kind of fun, but not too much fun. Uh, by the 1890s, there was a high end of, of photographic anatomical production, high quality photography, photographic reproduction required a great deal of skill and money. Uh, William McEwen's Atlas of Head Sections was a collector's item, fancy reference book, uh, contribution to anatomical surgical knowledge. Uh, even if expensive to purchase in book form, some of these photographs also appeared as low quality reproductions in journal articles. So they circulate in different ways. And McEwen was the first surgeon to perform brain surgery. He was very eminent and uh, considered a pioneer and venerated. Um, and so I don't, th I think this was kind of posing as, uh, as important to the treatment of brain, the development of brain surgery. But I don't see any evidence that it actually was. Uh, again, this is a research topic to go further. Um, these are brilliant, ugly, and beautiful at the same time. If you see the actual object, the printing is just luscious and gorgeous um, uh, and spooky. Looks a bit like an x-ray, but of course this is before the invention of the x-ray. Uh, and the photogravurist James Annan went on to a career as an art photographer. And the Museum of 
Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York has a large collection of his photographs. And he's an associate of Joseph Stiglitz and something called the photo secession. Now, I've argued that uh, the anatomical photograph was rhetorically an anti-aesthetic object. It made higher epistemological claims that aspired to outrank hand-drawn medical illustration, rejects the artist in favor of a recording transcription device, a fact signified by a certain deliberate ugliness. Even so, it was impossible to make a printed image that could stand entirely outside the system of aesthetics outside <coughs> cultural political regimes that structure representation and sensual experience. The photographic anatomist can't refrain, can't help himself from making aesthetic choices, can't refrain from clarifying and beautifying the anatomical view, even if he stands against the conventions of anatomical representation. So while there's ugliness here, it's a very artful ugliness, a set of aesthetic commitments that also have rhetorical effect. Um, so this is George McClellan of Philadelphia, and who made thousands and thousands of anatomical photographs, just in a, a small sample. He was the author of an 1892 photographic atlas of regional anatomy, uh, which went into about 10 editions before people decided that these were valueless, and also author of a book called Anatomy and its Relation to Art. He's professor of anatomy at the strictly medical Thomas Jefferson College in Philadelphia, but also the Philadelphia Academy of Fine Art, where he's associated with the painter Thomas Aikens and other Philadelphia painters. And there is a kind of artist sensibility in some of these. Uh, uh, McClellan performed the dissections himself, took the photographs, and colored them himself with watercolor, and took full advantage of improvements in the technology of photography and print reproduction, uh, which in the 1890s were greatly advancing but still very difficult to do. And that brings us to, this is going to be the last of my succession of actors. Uh, I began by claiming there was a kind of challenging, disturbing, crazy pleasure in anatomical photography. That's somewhat evident in the work of Rudinga and Fraser and McEwen and McClellan. But nothing is more excessive than Eugène Louis Doyen's topographical anatomy of 1911-1912. Historians have mainly written about Doyen as the first great medical motion picture maker. Between 1898 and 1906, he produced and starred in more than 60 motion pictures, including a notorious film of surgery to separate conjoined twins. He also invented new surgical devices and techniques and treatments, including a widely publicized electrical treatment for tuberculosis and an antibiotic uh, tonic to treat cancer. He was a prodigious surgeon. He performed many difficult surgeries with precision, speed, and theatrical flourish. He was perhaps the last great exponent of something I don't think there's a great literature on, but I would say is, at least in the English, <coughs> a great French tradition of extravagant surgical showmanship. He was also a notorious provocateur who denounced and insulted the Parisian medical establishment at every turn. Supporters described him as brilliant, detractors a charlatan. Issued in seven installments, uh, Dwyane's atlas of 279 heliotyped photographic plates of cross-section bodies imposes a grid upon his anatomical subjects instead of following the systems and lines of the body. Like no other anatomist before them, Dwyane systematically, mercilessly pressed upon photography as a visual rhetoric of the real. Against the grain of anatomical practice, he selected his subjects with no regard for the beauty of their bodies and show them in their entirety. Subjects show the marks of their origins at the low end of the social spectrum, stand before the viewer as people who led hard lives and whose body ended up unclaimed in the morgue, hospital, or prison. I'm not really sure what his source of bodies was. Uh, it's not quite anatomy verite, but a harsh kind of anatomical truth-telling, which to be sure had antecedents in the 17th and 18th century anatomies of Bidloo, Haller, William Hunter, and John Bell. It's as if 
uh, Dwyane was applying Emile Zola's call for naturalism to anatomical representation instead of literature. Even so, like the work of Zola, his anatomy was highly contrived and sensational. Uh, his atlas was a theater of anatomical cruelty, eccentrically staged, shocking. The aesthetic, really an anti-aesthetic, an anti-aesthetic on steroids, uh, was yoked to a strong scientific program. Dwyane wanted to create an indexed atlas of the human body as a comprehensive series of standardized slices. His slices are much more standardized and measured than anyone had ever done before. Seriality, the arrangement of objects into series, was increasingly important in late 19th and early 20th century science. In the serial method, science has collected and studied series of specimens arranged or divided into some standardized order or gradient to show the range of variations in a class of specimens or patterns uh, of embryological or evolutionary development or range of ecological adaptations. The rationale was that objects of study could be compared and from these comparisons scientists could derive generalizable laws or principles. Uh, while that was axiomatic in comparative anatomy and racial anatomy, evolutionary biology and embryology, uh, no one had ever done it rigorously, systematically, or comprehensively in gross anatomy the way Dwyane did it. And of course, it doesn't really, there are no generalizable principles I don't think that you can get from this because of the specificity of the specimens. Are, are, each one is idiosyncratic and unique and of course with something that Dwyane glories in. The images uh, cut right to a cleavage at the heart of the anatomical image tradition. The image in Vesalius' other canonical anatomical atlases constructs a universal human subject and its claims to show the human body, its demonstrations of what humanity consists of, and in conveying those claims via the use of bodies modeled upon classical ideals and norms of masculine and feminine, and also creating a new kind of canonical model of what a liver looks like, or what a heart looks like, what a kidney looks like. Those atlases, of course, also show the monstrosity of dissected bodies, uh, generalizable as the monstrosity of the anatomized body. And in some places, in Vesalius and other anatomists, the particularity of specimens. So there is a doubleness in these uh, earlier anatomies, a human-not-human -human binary. On the outside, we're all humans. On the inside, we're all monsters. Uh, and then there's a second binary, which is the spirit-matter binary, the, the perfect universal type versus the corrupted imperfect real, which troubles uh, anatomical illustration, the, the impossibility of perfection and conformity to universal natural laws and principles. I don't think um, Dwyane is troubled by it, but I think it, in general it, it troubles anatomists in this period. Like Vesalius, uh, Dwyane anatomizes to generalize. The anatomy of the human body is also his subject, but the harsh photographic specificity of the cross-section body undermines any normative ideal, runs counter to conventions of anatomical universalism, as do, of course, doctrines of racial anatomy, which were running rampant in the late 19th and early 20th century. In Dwyane's atlas, every anatomical subject receives the designation Che l'homme, house of man, or Che la femme, house of, of woman, uh, on the beginning page of the series, except this one, where, which Dwayne designates as Che un negro, uh, the house of the negro. It's unclear as to whether Dwayne chooses a subject with the intention of showing racial difference, other than the kinky hair at the bottom of the sliced. Uh, uh, do the slices show racial difference? I don't think so. Uh, it's more likely that just that Dwyane is opportunistically presenting subjects that he can get and exploiting whatever aspect he can use to provoke his readers. And so, a Negro. And shock there is. Uh, Dwyane's photographic plates are heavily retouched in some pictures in the series. The face is fully visible here, wearing what appears to be stage makeup. Uh, a cross-section face looks up imploringly in horror. Even more shocking is the way Dwyane provocatively takes the face apart, slice by slice, in every dimension, and then puts it back together 
Dwayne typically poses and silhouettes his subjects so that they appear to stand free, almost defiantly alive in the negative space of the page. Anatomical atlases are often theatrical. None that I know of is more glaringly transgressive than this. Dwayne goes beyond naturalism in its sensationalism, desire to shock, uh, shock intensified by the specificity of the subject whose face and body are utterly exposed and disfigured. Dwyan uh, was an egomaniac uh, and in love with photography and in love with the theatricality of anatomy and in love with himself. He loved to appear in photographs and in this sequence of photos he kneels in front of one of his cross-section specimens while his assistants work on preparing them. Uh, in the side view, the cross-sections look here like slices of porterhouse steak. So we have an archive not just of anatomical objects but of anatomical object creation. This is very unusual. I don't know of any other anatomist who's done anything remotely like this in drawing or in photography. Uh, Dwayne's method was to slice the body into a series of layers of equal thickness like leaves of a book of meat. The cadavers were prepared with a series of formalin injections to harden the organs while maintaining shape and color. Unlike the topographical anatomy of Brauna and Rudiger, no freezing was required. After the injection, specimens were left to cure and harden for two to six months to undergo what Dwyan called a veritable scientific mummification, length of time depending on levels of fat in the body and size of preparation. Uh, after that was done, the bodies were placed on a trolley mounted on rails and fed through the megaton. See, I know I've gone on for quite a while. It must be wearing you out. <coughs> anyway, so this is going through a, 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 a six horsepower engine. Uh, here is a very odd, difficult photograph of the band saw in action, working on a very odd and difficult object to produce. The cadaver's arms and legs have been sawed off in previous runs. Oddly, the penis has been mummified and injected to a state of erection so that it too can be sectioned. I have a kind of other project which is about the anatomy of the erect penis and what a difficult subject that is for anatomists to deal with and for and, and a difficult subject in art in general. Um, so it's just at the Queer Anatomies, uh, the Queer uh, British Art Exhibit in London, which did have a few. Anyway, I mentioned that lighting was always a challenge for anatomical photography. Not for Dwayne. Uh, he shows here. He shows off his massive arc floodlight apparatus, so he can flood his specimens with light. Uh, you, this is the very latest and very expensive light technology of his time. Slices mounted sequentially arranged for photography were retained afterward for display in lectures and in his museum, which was in Laurens, the cathedral town in France. Uh, the museum was destroyed during World War II. Uh, the topographical atlas was aimed at a medical audience, but Dwayne played everything out in public. He was a great figure, a celebrity swordsman, passionate socialist, Dreyfusard, uh, filmmaker, and all the other things I mentioned. And he was very rich. He inherited a, a family fortune that came from the manufacturer of a popular brand of champagne. Uh, so in, in one of these satirical cartoons, and you can see he's on the cover of many weekly satirical magazines. Uh, I've got, I think, maybe seven or eight uh, in my little database here. Uh, and you can see the, he's often pictured with uh, champagne and some element in there, and there's money coming out of his apron. and. Uh, there's lots of stories, but I'm going to go on because I, it's going too long here. A popular press took notice, made the obvious association. Dwyan, a sadistic ghoul, a figure of the bloodthirsty surgeon who regularly appeared on the stage of Paris's notorious Grand Guignol Theater, in short play, where short plays full of stage blood and demented mayhem were presented every night. These are the ancestors of 
the horror film, the slasher film. On the left, artist Georges Vila satirizes Dwyane's veritable, veritable mummification, a procedure which shocks even the figure of death. The hand gestures were a uh, Dwyane trademark, he, apparently, when he performed. And of course, these became known because he made motion pictures of, his, of himself performing surgery. And on the right, there's some medically themed posters that artist Adrian Barrère designed for Grand Guignol Theater. Uh, and yeah, the Grand Guignol Theater had five to seven little plays every night and lasted for almost a century in Paris. Um, uh, Barrère also did this 1905 satirical lithograph uh, of Dwyane showing great professors of the Faculty of Medicine unhappily attending Dwyane's performance of an operation on a naked beauty. Dwyane was a fr friend of Dr. Achille Adrien Proust, Marcel Proust's father, a frequent visitor to the Proust home, and it said that Proust based the character of Dr. Cotard, a sneering, pompous, insecure social climber given to jealousy and witticisms based in part on Dwyane. His initial attempt to present his anatomical slices to the public caused a riot on 19 April 1910. Audience of over 2,000 assembled in the Grand Amphitheater of the Parisian Faculty of Medicine to see the first lecture of Dwyane's course in topographic anatomy illustrated by projected hand-colored slides as well as preserved specimens, preserved slices. Um, Dwyane had just publicly denounced the professors of the faculty's incompetent mediocrities. Uh, audience was stocked with students determined to defend the honor of professors as well as paid thugs who were, came to determine to disrupt. Uh, so as soon as he started, a riot broke out and uh, attracted international attention, even this article in the New York Times, thousands of miles away. Dwyane was forced from the stage and the Faculty of Medicine canceled the course. But Dwyane nimbly moved on to other venues where he continued to give lectures featuring projections of both his slides and motion pictures and dissections performed on the spot for audiences of up to a thousand. Uh, these printed plates give some idea of how the colored slide projections looked. The actual lantern slides were destroyed. Uh, with all of his wealth, Dwyane had resources to shoot photographs and make motion pictures and also to finance the publication of his very own medical journal called Archive de Doyen. Uh, he also experimented with color photography, which was advancing greatly, still very expensive and difficult in the 1910s. Even now, these photographs uh, pop with bloody color. Brilliant. Uh, he experimented with photographic form as well as technology in this series he places the anatomical subject on a table uh, performs an anatomical guillotining in multiple slices. Um, Dwyane's topographical anatomy is not just a series, it's a sequence, has a kind of sequential motion to it. Invisible hand of the anatomist slices through the cadaver, more like a flip book than a movie, a delightful novelty animation. Each page has one image in register. The reader can get a sense of it by flipping quickly through the pages. OK, so obviously, Dwyane's work was his play emphatically playful, full of perverse satisfaction with what he could do. Uh, he loved to joke with his cadavers. And I have to admit to all of you, it's obvious that I also take pleasure in the excess. Uh, there was, of course, no joking or winking in the accompanying text to these. The captions uh, indexed to the reassembled body provide a dry table of contents uh, for the accompanying slices, all very scientific, no comedy. Uh, sociologist philosopher Bruno Latour famously argues there's nothing you can dominate as easily as a flat surface. He's mostly referring to the conversion of three-dimensional views uh, to two-dimensional rectangular pieces of paper, inscription, he calls it. But in these, there's an odd intermediary step, an odd pleasure and domination disrupts the process. Before translation to paper, the human body is chopped up to make overlaid, flat, stackable slices. Uh, 
Dwyane represents the flatness with rigor, but then he plays with the slices, takes them apart, puts them back together. So, and these images, I, I think they're deeply affecting, incredibly moving, uh, strange, um, defamiliarizing. It's a crazy kind of performance. Um, and he intended this to be provocative. Uh, he, he is kind of a hyper-aggressive, monstrous manliness, I think, in this. It's a show of heedless masculine risk-taking against the timidity, dullness, caution of his peers, a crazy kind of performance art uh, which runs up against scientific skepticism. He's both ultra-scientific and also sort of too demented, kind of too intoxicated with the, with the stuff to... So he's controversial. And I'm going to switch ahead because I'm getting worn out by this. This is, this is how, just to say that the aesthetic anti-aesthetic in Dwyane is a kind of theater. But even in sort of less controversial, there's a kind of aesthetic. This is just a practical manual of uh, autopsy. And there's still a kind of order, aesthetic order to these, uh, which is not emanate from anatomical photography. This is the same kind of aesthetic order that you can see in monthly magazines or, or, or photographic newspapers of the period. Uh, in, the, in this period, the halftone illustration is kind of also a symbol of the modern and becomes the, uh, uh, it spreads widely. And just to, to show you one more thing, I'm not going to talk about it much, but in the 1920s and 30s, then these photographic images do start circulating in the public. And, uh, and there's this one technique, which is to project an anatomical photograph on a living body and then make a photograph of that uh, or an anatomical illustration on a living body. So these were given at in, shown in ex exhibitions in Germany, popular health and medicine exhibitions, and, and uh, as uh, uh, slideshows, educational slideshows. And then this is an, uh, and it, this is just to show that this spreads widely. This is an Argentinian, again, amazing thing. This is the only thing that really comes close to. Um, Dwyane, this Argentine, who, Eliseo Canton, who was the director of a obstetrical clinic. He had access to thousands of bodies. And so he does this life-size uh, atlas of clinical obstetrical anatomy, normal and pathological. Uh, and there's, it's a research project to be done. I mean, the question is, what happened to these women? And, you know, the the folio is divided in half. One half is normal. Well, how did these women die? So many women die in in this normal situation. I believe some of them were murdered or committed suicide uh, in a society that uh, uh, people having children out of wedlock uh, suffered from. Women suffered great discrimination. Anyway. Um, on that note, I'll close. Uh, perhaps you're wondering about um, the pleasure in this. Uh, maybe we can talk about that. I, I could say a lot about that. But um, I believe that curiosity and looking at these things is entirely justified. Some people do want to bury these kind of illustrations away, as they do want to bury human specimens in museums. Uh, because the subjects never gave consent. And the photographicity of the images makes a difference. And in, in uh, some of this, like in the surgical materials that you work with, Catherine, um, they're artist drawn. Somehow that, even if they're very naturalistic and the faces are quite um, representable, they don't have the same valence. So on that note, I'm going to end. I wanted to give you a chance to see it. I crammed a lot in. It, I tried to give it to you in a pill, but it's a very big pill. <laughs> Sorry.